I am delighted to welcome you all to the 22nd edition of World Sustainable Development Summit. I, Dr. Vatsala Sharma, am the MC of this session. The session is on energy security and inclusive energy transition. The session will be moderated by uh, Mr. A.K. Saxena, Senior Fellow and Senior Director, Terry. We have a very distinguished line of speakers. We have Mr. Suman Berry, Vice Chairperson, Niti Aayog, India. Her Excellency, Ms. Kadri Simpson, European Commissioner for Energy. Dr. Dami Lola Ugunbai, CEO and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. Mr. Arne Walter, former chair Chairman International Energy Agency. Lord Adair Turner, Chairman, Energy Transition Commission. Professor Kazuhiko Takeuchi, President, Institute for Global, en Global Environmental Studies. Dr. John Kreitz, Chief Executive Officer, Rocky Mountain Institute. Mr. Saurabh Kumar, India Head Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Ms. Seema Paul, Program Director, Sequoia Climate Foundation. Yeah. I hand over the mic to the moderator, Mr. Saxena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vatsala. A very warm welcome to all the distinguished uh, panelists who are here. Uh, the session is on towards energy security and inclusive energy transitions. Energy security, as we all know, it has an important objective ever since the developmental path has been there in various economies. It got to the center stage in 2015 when sustainable development goals were adapted by the United Nations as a universal call to action to end the poverty in the form of SDG 7. Given the scenario which has unfolded now, it has gained increasing importance. Energy security, according to the International Energy Agency, is the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. The economy's plan for energy security based on the resource endowment and their adequacy to meet the energy demand. Technology they have to harness the available resources cost effectively and the financial resources to bridge the gap between the demand and supply, if any, through the imports. Invariably, energy security is seen from supply side perspective. However, it is equally important to underline that demand side has an extremely important role in furthering energy security. Last but not the least, we need to keep in mind that nobody is left behind in our quest for meeting the demand for energy from the newer sources. We are fortunate to have the distinguished panel. Some of them are he here with us. Some of them who could not join us have sent their recordings. So I will first start with Mr. Suman Berry, who is the Vice Chairperson of the Niti Aayog. Mr. Berry, please. The, uh, I will just say that the distinguished delegates do not need any sort of an introduction. So I'll do away with that. And in, because of the, in, in the interest of time, we will straight away go to the panelists. Over to you, Mr. Berry. Uh, thank you, Sri Saxena, and distinguished panel members, both here and uh, uh, virtually. Uh, I'm very pleased, uh, once again, to be um, at the World Sustainable Development uh, Summit. Uh, I think there was a stage when it was called the Delhi Sustainable Development Summit. Whatever it is, Terry has always uh, uh, reached out to me, made me feel welcome uh, in um, I can't recall last year. Yes, I think I had just assumed this role as Vice Chair Niti Aayog uh, last year when I think just as COVID was ebbing, uh, the, um, uh, the summit took place. And of course, now it's back to its usual s slot in, uh, in February. Uh, so just start to, to start with some facts. Uh, and then to go on to some of the challenges in the eight or 10 minutes that have been assigned to me. 
I mean, many of you know that despite global headwinds, India has uh, an impressive record in terms of climate, of economy, climate action, and the SDGs. Um, after, of course, a, a, a decline uh, due to COVID, the IMF <coughs> estimates India's growth at 6.8% in 2022. Um, our total primary energy consumption has grown about 4% a year over the last uh, 10 years, uh, about triple the growth rate of 1.3%. But despite such high growth, India's per capita energy consumption is <coughs> just about one third of the world average. Um, and um, this is India's uh, G20 year, and India's uh, G20 motto or slogan is one earth, one family, and one future. Uh, I won't go into uh, all of the achievements and the commitments that India has made, uh, certainly since COP21 and again uh, in COP26 and COP27, but I'm told by my staff that there's a climate change performance index which places India among the top five countries globally. And more surprising to me, uh, India is the only G20 country to break into the top 10 ranks. And India's, <coughs> excuse me, cumulative sc score in the SDG Global Index has improved from 55.88 in 2014 to 60.3 in 2022. Uh, I might also mention that uh, together with the Sustainable Development Goals, um, India subscribes to uh, a UN-compiled multidimensional poverty index, which is a measure of overall social outcomes, and there has been significant progress as measured by that uh, index over the last 15 years. Uh, in India's G20 year, we have many climate-related priorities, but as somebody who reports directly to the Prime Minister, I would um, particularly cite uh, his contribution to uh, the Sustainable Consumption SDG with the so-called Mission Life, Lifestyle for the Environment, which uh, essentially looks to citizens to be custodians of the planet and not just um, governments. Um, now, the topic here is energy security and inclusive uh, energy transitions. And I just thought that uh, I would depart from my prepared remarks to point out some of the tensions and dilemmas, particularly for uh, a large poor country like um, India. The bottom line of what I'm going to say is that at the end of the day, we're going to be dealing with a lot of uncertainty and some very hard political decisions. And I just wanted to indicate uh, uh, what the nature of those political decisions is likely to be. And perhaps if there's time to bring them to the, uh, to the Indian context. I had an uh, innings as the chief economist of Royal Dutch Shell between 2012 and 2016, and uh, was part of the so-called scenarios team at Shell. And uh, the analysis, uh, which was supported, uh, it's, still, it's available on the Shell website, although it's now somewhat dated, essentially made the point that uh, the best way to ensure the flourishing of renewables uh, was if fossil prices were high and remained high. So um, if you like, prices of the kind that we have seen recently uh, in the 80 to $100 range, if there was some assurance that those global prices, and I'm talking of oil, uh, gas prices have perhaps been even higher, actually that is a very uh, uh, helpful environment for the spread of renewables. But you can imagine that that uh, 
conflicts immediately with the definition of energy security uh, that our chairperson or moderator put forward, which is affordability. And so a central policy design dilemma is how do you provide the protection or how do you encourage uh, renewables uh, while at the same time ensuring uh, affordability. And the answer to that obviously lies in carefully targeted subsidy schemes. We have seen recently in Europe that if in fact uh, both businesses and consumers are confronted with very high prices, the margin of substitution is enormous. And we have also seen that uh, a great deal or that substantial resources were devoted by European governments to assisting uh, populations uh, with um, uh, extraordinary electricity prices and to some extent heating prices. I think what I'm trying to say is that the magic of the marketplace will only get us so far. Yes, um, either carbon taxes or um, cap and trade have an important role to play, but to ensure, particularly for an energy poor country like India, that uh, you can re meet your access requirements while still providing a facilitating environment for new energy sources uh, does require substantial uh, government action. The second point I wanted to make is um, and, uh, is that there is a very difficult set of issues involved with stability versus volatility. Because we have seen since 2014 how volatile both oil and gas prices have been. I'm not talking that much about coal because coal is a resource that's available in India. Uh, but I will, uh, in my concluding remarks, make a point about what we mean by energy security, even with respect to a domestic resource. But, um, you know, if you accept my first argument that uh, investment in renewables is supported by expectations of a sustained high hydrocarbon price, then how you actually send out those signals uh, at a time of extreme volatility in the global marketplace, and might I add, how you maintain your competitiveness while others around you are benefiting from uh, that volatility is a second design issue that I don't think has been uh, fully explored. The third issue that I'd like to bring uh, to the attention of the audience is something called the green paradox, uh, which was uh, something commented on by a, a German uh, economist, which is that oil stays in the ground if people expect the future price to be higher than the present price. But if it really is believed to be the case that uh, oil demand is going to peak and then decline, and I think that the death of oil ha has been projected um, perhaps uh, prematurely, under those circumstances, there's terrific incentive to pump harder, which would also mean that oil prices go down. So, uh, in all of these, um, to, f to maintain a steady course in the face of all of these conundrums, it is going to require nimble and agile policy, particularly when you're dealing with uh, a, a population which not only has uh, limited access to energy, but also uh, has, uh, is relatively uh, uh, poor by the standards of, um, of the citizens, say, in, in uh, Europe. My final point would be about diversification, um, which is to say, I, and here I would come to the first element in the definition from uh, the provided by our uh, moderator, which is 
uninterrupted supply. <clears throat> we tend to fear that interruptions will be geopolitical interruptions, but let us be clear that interruptions even of a domestic fuel like coal can arise from other sources such as, um, uh, if you like, environmental uh, objections, uh, legitimate those might be, transportation issues. There's also the issue of um, the stability of the grid. Uh, we are all familiar, unfortunately, in India with blackouts and brownouts. And so to assume that our energy security in as measured by uninterrupted supply is more secured by self-sufficiency rather than by diversification amongst suppliers and amongst fuels, I think is a proposition that needs to be examined. So again, let me thank uh, the organizers for allowing to make me to make the opening statement. I, I have gone over my time. I hope not by too much, but it allows me now to sit back and learn from the other distinguished panelists. Back to you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Berry. Thanks a lot for letting us know about the certain uncertainties which are there and the need for the very hard type of political decisions and giving a flavor about of all of these. Thank you very much. Now may I request the organizers to play the video message, the ministerial address of Her Excellency Madam Kadri Simpson, European Commissioner for Energy. Good afternoon and greetings from Brussels. It's an honor to address all of you at today's summit. In Europe, the energy transition is at full speed. Already 38% of our electricity comes from renewables. Our commitment is to become climate neutral by 2050. One year ago, the Russian invasion of Ukraine kicked off a huge shift in how we think about our energy system. We have not changed course, but simply the speed at which we reach our end destination. Our sustainability and climate goals remain the same. Our ambition is now even higher. As part of our Repower EU plan, accelerating the rollout of renewables is central. It is a strategic investment, not only in our sustainable future and economic growth, it's the key to unlocking our energy security. Every kilowatt hour of electricity we generate from solar, wind, hydropower or biomass is one less that we rely on from fossil fuels. We see our partners across the globe leading similarly ambitious energy transitions. India is a strong ally in this regard. Under the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Partnership, we cooperate across many sectors. Energy efficiency, renewables, including supporting an emerging offshore wind sector in Tamil Nadu and Gujarat, are all part of the agenda. And it aligns perfectly with India's own ambitions 500 gigawatts of non-fossil fuel energy produced by 2030. We will work hand in hand with India on what will help you reach these ambitious goals. Electricity grid integration and regional interconnections come to mind. No doubt, renewable hydrogen will be part of your success. Last year, we had our first EU-India Green Hydrogen Forum. Decarbonizing heavy industry and other hard to abate sectors demands a solution. Hydrogen can be that solution, and it will be a pillar of our energy dialogue in the future. A swift transition also means stable global supply change. The last few years have taught us not to take these for granted. We rely on secure supply change for the raw materials of our energy future solar panels, batteries and electrolyzers. So we will work with India and others, such as the International Solar Alliance, to diversify our supply chain and make them more resilient in the process. In this spirit, the EU and its member states are the biggest providers of global public climate finance. For the second year in a row, we have exceeded 23 billion euro in support and we put pressure on our partners to step up their climate finance to the Global South. Finally, the heart of our energy transition is a just transition. We must leave no one behind. 
Inclusivity means closing the NIH access gap, and Africa is a priority continent. We launched last year the Global Gateway Investment Package for Africa and the Africa EU Green NIH Initiative. The EU will mobilize about 3.4 billion euros of grants to support renewable energy, NIH efficiency, the just transition, and the greening of local value change. We are supporting just transition in partner countries that depend on coal, such as Vietnam, Indonesia, and South Africa. All combined, it means tackling energy poverty across the globe. It means supporting coal regions in the transition to a more diversified future. And it means, finally, closing the gender gap. These are values we strongly believe in. And I know that from today's topic, we are not alone in sharing them. Ladies and gentlemen, my congratulations to our friends from Terry for organizing today's event. I'm wishing you excellent discussions. Thank you. So I think in absentia, I would like to thank, the, thank Madam Kadri Simpson for her valuable remarks the role of various technologies which she has, she has underlined, and most importantly, the role of regional interconnections, which is going to play a very important role in the energy security. She uh, sort of alluded to the initiatives of the ISA, and one sun, one word, one grid is another initiative of our Prime Minister and the Prime Minister of France, which is paving the way for the regional interconnections. So thank you so much. May I now request the uh, organizers to play the leadership address of Dr. Damilola Ogunbi, CEO and Special Representative of UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. Distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you all today. I would like to congratulate the Energy Resource Institute, Terry, on bringing this important global gathering together once again. In recent times, the just transition discussion has focused largely on macroeconomic energy security challenges, setting back some of the most recent gains made on accelerated decarbonization commitments and progress on ending energy poverty. As we look at action on advancing energy access, we need to promote a just energy transition in the end use sector and in productive use applications of energy, especially when it comes to agriculture and the MSME sector. As the world's largest employer, the agriculture and food production sector plays an important role in efforts to reduce poverty and improve people's livelihoods. For example, the world depends on smallholder farmer households globally to eat Yet, this same group of people happen to be the poorest and most food insecure. As climate change becomes more pronounced, the agricultural sector is witnessing a loss of productivity due to the heat stress and having growing irrigation needs, which can now be met more sustainable through solar-based irrigation, rather than through diesel pump sets that have high fluctuating costs. Solar water pumps and solar systems allow farmers to transition from dependence on low-value rain-fed crops to farming high-value crops year-round. While the cost of solar pumps has decreased by 97 percent in the last decade, most smallholder farmers still cannot afford them. Similar challenges exist in other sectors, especially for micro and small industries, but I'm pleased that so much effort and innovation is going on into thinking about effective delivery models, which of course vary by country. Sustainable Energy for All runs a resource-based financing program in five countries. This is called the Universal Energy Facility. This includes for mini grids, productive use, and soon for clean cooking solutions. In exactly this spirit to get financing that is needed into sustainable energy solutions to scale, and more importantly, to uplift people out of poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, many countries look to G20 members for leadership, and this is especially important in the energy sector. 
the G20 countries have agreed to accelerate the energy transition, including ensuring the achievement of the sustainable global development targets by 2030, particularly on the access to reliable, sustainable and affordable modern energy for all. All the G20 ministers have committed to energy transition process that leaves no one behind. And it is against this backdrop that the Bali Compact was developed. This compact should be fast-tracked to ensure the transition roadmaps for the energy sector in each of the G20 countries is undertaken. We can no longer rely upon conventional mechanisms to help us fund the energy transition. We need fresh, innovative and affordable financing mechanisms. It is also vital that more investment and funding are available to developing countries to ensure that the twin objectives of energy access and energy transition are met. This is why I'm so happy to be supporting the Indian's G20 presidency, which is bold and committed to supporting the global south at large. We're especially looking forward to bringing the African member states to a joint meeting with the G20 energy ministers to jointly forge a pathway forward. This is a crucial time. We are not on track to reach SDG 7, which in turn is essential to a net zero future. There is no pathway to net zero without addressing energy poverty systematically. So we must use every opportunity to act decisively. This is why I'm not with you in person today, because I am on ground launching our standalone solar for productive use program in Nigeria to advance energy and development in developing countries. Thank you for your interest and attention. I wish you all a productive deliberation. On my behalf and on behalf of all the attendees here, I would like to thank Madam Domila Ogunbi for her remarks. Thank you so much. May I now turn to the organizers to play the leadership address by Lord Adair Turner, who happens to be the Chairman of Energy Transition Commission, and I have the pleasure and privilege of having an association with him from 2017. So please uh, play the video of Lord Adair Turner. Hello to all of you there at the World Sustainable Development uh, Summit. I'm sorry I can't be with you there uh, on this occasion. I've been there in many years uh, in the past. Uh, but I'm glad to be able to provide some thoughts and input uh, to your discussions and debates uh, there in Delhi. Now, sustainability has many dimensions, but from the Energy Transitions Commission's point of view, which I chair, our main focus is climate change, how to limit ch climate change and how to get emissions down in order to do that. Let's be clear that we cannot limit climate change completely. A lot of it has already occurred. The world has warmed by 1.2 degrees centigrade and almost inevitably we will get to 1.5 on the basis of the emissions that have been put out already and that are bound to occur. And at 1.5 degrees centigrade there will be very harmful effects and every 0.1 degree centigrade above 1.5 will get worse and worse and above 2 is potentially catastrophic in particular for countries uh, like India. So it is really important that across the world, led by the developed countries who have a historic responsibility and must get there first, we get to net zero, but that all countries get there to net zero. To do that, of course, we have to decarbonize energy supply, and in particular, to decarbonize electricity supply. And India's target of 500 gigawatts of zero carbon electricity by 2030 is therefore a crucial part of India's strategy. But it is also important for us to focus on the demand side, on energy efficiency, energy productivity. How do we grow GDP, but in a way which doesn't use uh, as much energy as we used to in the past? How do we reduce the energy inputs per unit of GDP growth. So I think we have to focus on that side as well, on the demand side and on the efficiency side, and I'm sure you'll debate that at the summit. But I think we should also recognize that we already know the single most important thing that we can do to improve energy efficiency and its electrification. 
Every time somebody drives around the streets of London or Delhi in a four-wheeler or a three-wheeler or a two-wheeler, if it is an internal combustion engine, they will be turning 75% of the energy into heat and only 25% of the energy into kinetic energy to drive the vehicle or the bicycle uh, forward. If we switch to electricity, to battery electric vehicles, 90% or more of the energy is doing what we want, which is to provide mobility, and only 5 to 10% is to producing wasteful and in some cases harmful heat. So we need very clearly to recognize that the route to a zero carbon uh, economy and to a more efficient economy is deeply electrified. In the UK, that means that even though we're a rich developed country, we will take total electricity use from today's 300 terawatt hours to as much as 700 terawatt hours by uh, 2050. And there in India, you will have to take 1,200 terawatt hours to 6,000 terawatt hours or more by mid-century to have not only a clean economy, but a growing... ...and promote sustainable development. As already mentioned in the previous uh, session by Mr. Ono, or Vice Minister of the Ministry of the Environment of the Government of Japan. To achieve net zero by 2070, India needs to create a sustainable ecosystem through the use of renewable energy sources, encourage public-private partnerships, innovation and research in sustainable technologies. India has significant potential to become a leader in renewable energy technology. It is essential to integrate local communities, especially MSMEs and farmers, into India's sustainable development plans. Gender responsible budgeting and inclusive decision making will ensure women have an equal say in shaping India's sustainable development policies. Japan and India show us the opportunities that come with the challenges and we must work together to find innovative solutions for a better future. Toward this end, uh, my organization, IGES, and Terry have been engaging in joint efforts such as uh, Japan-India Technology Matching, Matchmaking Platform, or JITMAP, in short, and have conducted research on technology co-innovation to explore how the two can strengthen collaboration on innovative technologies. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Takeuchi. Thank you so much for your uh, insightful observations in regard to the challenges and initiatives which are there in Japan and telling some of the important <coughs> action points which could be there. Thank you so much. May I now request Dr. John Kreitz, Chief Executive Officer of Rocky Mountain Institute, to give us leadership address. Over to you, John. Thank you, AK. Can you hear me with the, the lab mic? Yes? Good, good. I'll do it that way rather than using my hands here. Um, there is a, just a beautiful line in Ernest Hemingway's book, The Sun Also Rises, where one character asks another, how did you go bankrupt? And the response was gradually, then suddenly. Folks, we're at the gradually to suddenly transition in the energy world, and India is perfectly poised to both accelerate and benefit from it. At the same moment that we're talking about ecological tipping points, we're achieving economic ones. Solar and wind are now the most economic form of new energy for 95% of the population on the planet. As a result, we're adding more of both every year, a lot more. And in fact, this year, and every year going forward, we're going to add more renewables than we have growth in energy itself, in our energy appetite itself, right? Which means, and here I'm going to differ from you a little bit, Suman, right? Which, it means that we have peaked fossil fuels. 
And that is something that certainly RMI you know, was talking about a year ago, but since we've been talking about it, IEA has come forward and said the same thing. And now just two weeks, three weeks ago, BP and their analysis, again, not, not Shell, uh, but BP, a leading global major, has come forward and said the same thing. So as we continuously increase the amount of these economic renewables, we're going to accelerate the downward slide of fossil fuels. And this cheap energy supply makes all sorts of other changes in the global economy both possible and profitable, ranging from batteries and vehicle electrification to heat pumps and hydrogen. Certainly, and we already heard a statement around this, that scaling hydrogen is a particularly important lever for India to develop. And it's already taken great strides in the launch of its green hydrogen mission. Clean, green molecules are a key resource to decarbonize the hard to abate sectors like steel, ammonia, and shipping. And at the same time, the use of plentiful domestic solar, it reduces the dependence on foreign fuels supporting national energy security. The same benefit, by the way, is accessible to 90% of the rest of the countries on this planet. Developing local renewables to empower local economies helps grow employment, access, security, and resiliency the world over. We need to decarbonize our heavy industry with this new and cheap energy. And India, while holding the G20 presidency, can generate momentum toward differentiated markets for low carbon products. We need to reward producers of low carbon steel, low, low carbon cement, and other materials to give countries and companies that buy these products the confidence that they're contributing to global goals. Of course, policy measures are critical to align markets and use these differentiated products. We need to create common, transparent, and interoperable standards across complex global supply chains. Doing this right, by the way, also takes scaling beyond big companies as we engage on scope three emissions and involves the MSME sectors and pulls forward entrepreneurial activity to ensure solutions are found among local innovation as well. This moment of great economic opportunity can be a moment of democratization for the world as well. <coughs> Distributed renewable energy, energies such as rooftop solar and mini grids can not just help decarbonize electricity, but also provide the resilience, the local jobs, the better social outcomes that we all want and need. Energy consumers are important drivers of the clean energy transition. This is apparent across the range of incentives that spur consumer adoption to scale, EVs and solar policies. International platforms for peer learning can play crucial roles in sharing lessons. We can't get to 100% clean without engaging 100% of the global population and all can share in the dividends of this transformation. But to do so, we need to invest up front in order to achieve the long-term returns. Hence, financing is the critical need for emerging markets and developing economies, where the focus must be on pushing the envelope on MDB reforms that can help unlock private capital for net zero aligned investments across the global south. India, again, with its leadership and presidency of the G20, can facilitate collaboration design of innovative financial instruments that can help attract capital flows in developing economies from everything from zero emission vehicles to rooftop solar to net zero construction to big industrial investments in green production. Building on its commitment to ensure sustainability of all communities, as outlined in the LIFE initiative, India is in a strong position to catalyze global change. It can play an active role in ensuring G20 deliberations accelerate innovative low carbon technologies, mobilize finance for the global south, and focus on the interventions that bring forward marginalized communities to help them better participate in the energy transition. We're at a moment of shifting from gradually to suddenly, and India's accelerating growth, perfectly timed with this opportunity, is going to help serve as a beacon for all. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for touching up a number of very, very important points. Thank you so much. Uh, we now have the video link uh, with Mr. Annie Walter. So, very warm welcome to you, Mr. Walter. And we are all ears to you now. Over to you, Mr. Annie. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me, Mr. Saxena. I'm honored to be uh, with you uh, on screen from uh, Norway, but I'm sad uh, not to be with you in person. But let me commend Terry on convening its annual WSDS, a unique meeting place in the Global South, gathering the diversity of stakeholders. It inspires ambition and are walking the talk of sustainable development. We meet amid escalating war in Europe. The disruptive impact is global. Energy has been weaponized for geopolitical purpose. And energy costs have skyrocketed. Energy security is top agenda. This can slow down the pace of our endeavors for inclusive transition to green energy and reaching our climate goals. The future comes by itself. A sustainable one that does not. Global developments tell us that we are in transit to a new normal. A feeling of polycrisis exacerbates here and now uncertainties for governments, for business, for society, for individual citizens. We have to do more than just put on our life jackets. We must navigate through rough waters ahead of geopolitical change, of economic change, and climate change. We are all in the same boat, but I'm afraid uh, the boat is leaking. Global summits underscore the urgency of a just transition to a decarbonized world. We do not have the luxury of just waiting for it somehow to happen. The gap between existing policies and climate and carbon emission targets is widening. Urgent action is required now at all levels, local, national, regional, and global, and by all st stakeholders. Setting ambitious goals long into the future is good, but achieving them through workable solutions is much better. We must bear in mind that energy is not an end in itself. It is a means for sustainable global and economic uh, uh, development. We need simply more of it. Energy demand is expected to increase by 10 percent by 2030, driven by emerging and developing economies. Despite all that is being done to develop and scale up renewable energy options, and contrary to climate ambition, global demand for fossil fuels is now increasing and that at higher price levels. We need both energy transition and energy addition. The mantra must be cleaner energy used in a more efficient way, accessible and affordable to a larger share of the world's population. For this to happen, investments in energy have to be ramped up across sources and supply chains, not only in renewables, but also in oil and natural gas and CCS. Underinvestment undermines energy security. High energy prices and supply disruption put public support for climate goals at risk. Inclusive and equitable energy transition cannot be left to market forces alone. Governments must play their part by providing incentives and conducive framework conditions that nudge industry in the right and sustainable direction. A global public-private partnership is required where all stakeholders have their role to play. But geopolitical dynamics are pushing multilateral approaches to the back burner. Go it alone energy policies founded on protectionism are divisive and conflict prone. Benefiting those already well endowed in resources as well as economic technological and military prowess, leaving the vulnerable rest behind. We must instead strengthen our global energy policy interrelationship, a prerequisite for energy security, for just energy transition, reducing carbon emissions, and reaching our climate goals. My final point, 
would be to underscore the importance of the global north stepping up its financial and technological assistance to the global south. We must listen more closely to the global south as it speaks with increasing determination in our global dialogue and action for energy security and inclusive energy transition. Especially this year, with India as president of the G20 and being the voice of the Global South. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Walter. Thanks a lot. Time is short. May I now request uh, Mr. Saurabh Kumar, India Head of Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. We have about 10 minutes, 8 minutes, 34 seconds to go, and we have two speakers. Over to you, Saurabh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll try and, try and be as brief as possible. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, I'll make very few quick points because a lot of things have already been stated by the distinguished panelists here. Uh, as we head towards energy transitions, and, and let me remind ourselves that this is not the first energy transition that this world has seen. Uh, unfortunately, all other transitions have played over 50 to 100 years, but we possibly need to be much more nimble uh, in this. Four or five things uh, uh, which, which I think are important. Number one is solar, and, and particularly decentralized solar. That's uh, community-based, that has a lot of uh, impact on the, on the communities. Most importantly in this country, about 150 gigawatt of, of decentralized solar potential exists in agriculture. Now that itself has not just uh, uh, from the economic perspective, but also social perspective is something that uh, we, we need to work upon. Number two is, uh, again, many uh, panelists talked about it, is electrification of transport. And there, I think, uh, under the stewardship and leadership of Niti Aayog, uh, ESL, which is my previous organization, did wonderful job as far as the buses are concerned, showing to the world how mobility as a service could really change the way things. Uh, 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 that leads to me the third point. While carbon finance and, and Global North to support Global South is important, but equally important is the fact that the government enables investment in, those, uh, in the sector. Now, while in, uh, taking the bus example, for example, uh, th there are about 17,000 buses which are to go on the roads of, of the country on a service model, which means the private sector will invest needs about three to four billion dollars of investment. Now, of course, uh, and, and the counterparties are ones which are really, really weak, which is the state transport. So I think what is needed is some sort of a risk guarantee, payment security mechanisms that could let the, the investments come in on a commercial basis. And, and to give an example, which, which the power ministry has done wonderfully well, is, is the revamped distribution scheme, where the metering as a service has become the main model, where again, a private capital is, is, has been catalyzed. As we speak, about 50 million smart meters have already been awarded by, by distribution utilities, which means that they will uh, catalyze nearly 30,000 crores of investment over the next three to four years. Why it has happened? A, a very, very good payment security mechanism has been, has been put inside the whole thing. So that's my third point. Fourth, I think, what is needed in this new age regulation and new age policies. The policy makers and regulators need to be nimble, need to look at what is needed, because many sectors that are traditionally being, being driven by, by different uh, ministries uh, in, in, in case of governments are now converging. Mobility is more uh, uh, electricity. It can also lead to storage. So, so there is a need for a convergence in terms of in terms of ideas, in terms of policies, in terms of regulations. And I must say, India stands as, as a shining example of what ambition could look like, how we can catalyze very large-scale intervention. And my final point is, again, something which, which India is quite proud about, is energy efficiency. And we have seen, we have shown that energy efficiency as a business can be scaled. Uh, energy efficiency as a policy can become uh, which can, can touch a huge amount of uh, the PAD scheme of, of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, for example, is a case in point. The LED program of EESL changed dramatically the way uh, uh, lighting is done in India. So with these, let me, let me uh, once again thank uh, uh, the organizers. I think we are well on, on the road of 
what the honorable prime minister has committed to the to the world of uh, decarbonization by 2070 and we will certainly lead the way as far as the energy transitions is concerned thank you very much thank you saurabh thank you so much for sticking to the time you have taken just half of 8 minutes and 34 seconds so now 4 minutes for mrs seema paul over to you seema ji thank you mrs sena on My proposal is that in is this better? Yeah, 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 it sounds like that. So, ladies and gentlemen, my proposal is that Lindia leverages its core strengths and accelerates equitable energy transition. What can India do? It can replicate the unfolding success of the renewable energy sector on the demand side, on the side of energy efficiency. And I'll build on the point that my uh, preceding speaker and good friend Saurabh Kumar has made. While the LED success story which he led at EESL is impressive, I think India's potential is multifold. And what does the RE, the renewables success story, tell us? My academic friends may disagree with me, and I know that they do. But I do believe that the target India set on renewable energy and how it has upped that target has really played a vital role in the solar and renewables revolution that we are seeing in this country. European Union is perhaps the only uh, region in the world which has an energy efficiency target. And my proposition is, might India consider a target learning from its own experience of how it has been able to accelerate um, you know, solar, um, solarization? Uh, so how might this address energy security might be a question you might ask. Right, energy security we know has two different aspects. It's the macroeconomic security where we don't have to import fossil fuels uh, with all the positive consequences that that brings. But there's also the equity angle and access of uh, you know, energy for all people. Uh, and a lot of Indians don't have access to energy or have access to unclean energy. So, um, uh, how that, you know, if we um, um, really emphasize energy efficiency, which is the first fuel, and rightly called the first fuel, we reduce the demand for energy. And when we reduce the demand for energy, we reduce the infrastructure investment costs. And we don't have to ask for finance from the North. We need it, uh, we deserve to have it, but we don't have uh, to ask for that much more, right? And the savings that we might accrue from our own investments can be plowed towards the subsidies or the, uh, that enable the access to happen. So that is a benefit that energy efficiency will provide at the macroeconomic level, which then can be plowed into uh, ensuring better access for people, right? Uh, the other aspect is about combining this with the digitization, which is India's core strength, and we have to leverage our core strengths. By, um, you know, the smart meter revolution that you refer, uh, referenced, that India is witnessing with speed and at scale, uh, would enable us to introduce time of day tariffs and when we introduce time of day tariffs, the consumer has incentive to increase the use of uh, energy during periods where renewables are high and the grid is able to supply them and reduce them uh, during the uh, non-peak hours. It also uh, incentives can also be developed for consumers to also have batteries. In fact, they will have batteries through electrification of cars that is happening 
and electrification of two wheelers that is happening rapidly. And they can then, in the peak hours, provide that energy back to the grid. That then means that the uh, grid has an ability to have more renewables, which is a challenge that we are facing and that will increase. This then, energy efficiency then creates a very virtuous cycle between um, the renewable energy and itself. And we leverage digitization. By leveraging digitization, we are also able to create solutions in our country which we can export. After all, uh, digitization has enabled us to really increase our foreign revenues. And this is a growing field globally. So we definitely could take advantage of the global trends and become the front runners in this space. When we talk of uh, the poor and energy access for the poor people, and we have so many uh, millions of people who are poor and who don't have access to energy, the topic that often comes up is about energy efficient appliances. But most of the appliances that we speak about actually really benefit the rich and the middle classes. Uh, yes, the uh, use of um, refrigerator, television is increasing in uh, rural areas. And uh, you know the trends and data show that this will actually go up. So yes, there is benefit uh, from energy efficiency norms for these appliances. But I think there is a greater revolution that can be had in terms of jobs, in terms of productivity, in terms of increasing the incomes of the poor by combining the clean energy trends with productive uses. Uh, CEW, a partner of ours, has done, um, and many of you know them, they're a big player here in India, has shown that there is uh, a $53 billion market in India for productive enterprises. Here we are talking of cold chains, uh, which of course uh, are happening, but they're not happening uh, uh, through decentralized energy or through clean energy. And much of the infrastructure that is being put up is very inefficient. So there is a huge potential in productive uh, processes uh, for energy efficiency uh, to be advanced. And we should not forget about that. That relates to food processing, cold chains, and many other um, uh, you know, milk, uh, milk uh, technologies that can be deployed in rural India and will enable uh, people to have better incomes. Uh, so I think a greater focus is needed there in order for the equity angle to be also incorporated in this, uh, in this revolution that we are witnessing and are honored to be a part of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seema Ji. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will not stand in the way of uh, you all. Mr. Suman Berry, I'm especially thankful to you. You had your next appointment, which is very, very near. And I think thank you so much for overstaying. Thanks a lot. I think I would just like to conclude by saying that we need local, regional, and global action. The collaborative and cooperative approach is a must. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. And thanks to all the panelists and the, all the video recordings which have been there. Thanks. On behalf of Terry and WSTS uh, Secretariat, we thank all the distinguished speakers for an insightful discussion. The next session starts at 7 p.m. <laughs>